let me let me first try to to give my own personal take on the the institutionally situated conversations that we've we've managed to have uh, in these uh, two days of uh, very interesting uh, presentations. Um, of course, um, and this was um, referred by, by several speakers, including Roger Beckhaus and José Luis Cardoso, uh, it's important to, when studying the international uh, circulation of economic ideas, particularly we, when we are, uh, let us say, um, to use Beckhaus's uh, notion, in a net importer of economic ideas, that is a peripheral country, to, um, to simultaneously to, to realize that institutions matter through which uh, these ideas circulate, and we have several speakers emphasizing this, uh, but also we have to have and um, for example, Nuno Martins pointed this out, to have a clear, to have a detailed account of which ideas do circulate. Uh, not only an institutional take, but a very clear uh, and detailed depictions of the kinds of ideas. And uh, for example, Carlos uh, Bastian um, made an effort to, to clarify these ideas oh. through his division of theoretical and doctrinal ideas in a particular moment of the Portuguese history. Um, Anna Costa also gave us, gave us a, a presentation of a particular a set uh, of uh, policy ideas and the way they, they've circulated in a particular moment, a very more recent moment. So we have to, um, to be very conscious of... Uh, of the historical context and um, particular institutions, uh, set of institutions and particular sets of ideas that circulate. Um, I think we should also be very conscious of, of the metaphors that we've used. And this was also mentioned in the discussions. Um, since we are in a peripheral country, I mean, uh, by using the word periphery or core periphery, we might be thinking in, in very different terms. Davis pointed out, uh, John Davis pointed out at a certain, at a certain moment in a, in a discussion that, well, core periphery does not work in an area of mobile resources, that I think I'm, I'm quoting. So in, in, in here we, we have a clear understanding of, uh, of, a, of a model of circulation of ideas in which, um, we have a kind of uh, uh, kind of comparative advantage reasoning, uh, but we can also have a, a notion of a core periphery uh, using the notion, the metaphor of core periphery, uh, without having this kind of comparative advantage reasoning in the market for for ideas, having other types of connecting principles. To use Vitor Neves' important uh, notion. Um, uh, for example, by adopting, which I think is the more or less uh, implicit assumption when many of us use this core periphery metaphor, adopting a kind of world system vision of a hierarchical order, which was somehow developed against this model of a, co of a comparative uh, trade theory, very simple trade theory model applied to the circulation of economic ideas. So this, I think this, in, not only be very attentive to the institutional uh, and ideational details of ideas, ideational detail in, the, in our accounts, but be very attentive to the, to the way we import metaphors to refer to this special dimension, which of course is unavoidable if we are talking about the international circulation of ideas, no matter how we depict the international space always matters, and this is an insight that we get from economic geography, uh, and it also matters in the economic circulation of ideas. But also, and I think, for example, uh, the presentation, several presentations, including by M Marco Guidi mentioned this, 
the, the supports through which ideas circulate. That is, ideas can circulate through books. What kind of, what kind of books? Um, and of course, uh, you mentioned the global popularization of political economies through, through, through elementary textbooks, and this is one way of circulation of ideas. Um, there, are, there is another way in which ideas can circulate, particularly uh, some ways of representing economic ideas, for example, through mathematical symbols, can facilitate and this was, I think, Roger Beckhaus' point about the uh, late 19th century. Uh, certain ideas are more amenable to circulation, given the way they are depicted. And perhaps, and I think uh, John Davis also mentioned this, um, if uh, one of his mechanisms for fragmentation was, of course, um, not only the way certain more applied uh, economics um, is leading to the fragmentation of the economic field, but also this, uh, how this perhaps more applied economics can become also a more contextualized economics. So um, the answer that economists give to is much more is is becoming increasingly, if, the, if we accept this diagnosis, uh, it depends. So I think perhaps it's one of the <laughs> signs of hope <laughs> for economics if we get more of this answer to, <laughs> to economic questions. It depends. And if we, we go to this more applied economics, yeah. in a certain way, in the, in the model of this Danny Roderick kind of economic reasoning, uh, which is simultaneously empirical and accounts for many recipes, we will get this uh, answer more, f more frequently. But this, I mean, uh, di different presentations deal with issues of chronology in a very different way, because we had presentations about the 18th century, the 19th century, and also about the 20th century, and we had presentations about uh, late and 21st century, actually. Uh, so, so we had <laughs> a wide chronological um, dimension here. So, uh, I think the way ahead for our particular <laughs> scientific project uh, that we, we get is a, a so a very uh, a need to be very attentive to the to the institutional detail, to the detail of particular economic ideas, to the role of per of well positioned economists. This was also pointed out in, for example, in um, um, Nuno Ornelas Martins and Carlos Bastia presentations. Um, the way particular economists are absolutely central, and we have to also to have a detailed, individualized account <coughs> of, also in the peripheries, also in the peripheries, particularly in the peripheries, where the, the, the small-scale nature of the intellectual community um, allows us to really point it out to very crucial individuals, without which some developments could not have happened. So we have to, <laughs> we have to be individualist. In <laughs> almost in a methodological sense, individuals uh, are quite important um, um, when they modify economic curriculum, when they go abroad for study, when they write popularized versions either for stu of, of dominant economic ideas, either, either for the consumption of students, but also for the consumption of a wider audience. Uh, so, when we want to see the changes in economic ideas in Portugal in the 70s and 80s, we know that there are crucial players, and they are crucial players because they, they occupy particular positions, they have access to funding, 
they, they, they studied abroad, uh, and we have to have very detailed depictions of their own evolution and the networks through which they participate and the people they, they, they influence. And of course, the, the economic ideas that they uh, imported, uh, but also the, the way they applied those economic ideas to the particular context of the Portuguese economy and society in the 70s and 80s. Let, let me give you a, a particular, I mean, a, a particular example of what I'm aiming at. I mean, we, I mean, in the 60s and 70s, we got a, a, a number, a small number of, of Portuguese economists who went to do their, their PhDs abroad for the, f and this, and, uh, for the first time, this is a, a novelty. Uh, and of course, in, in, those, in those PhD programs, particularly in the North American, in the, in the USA context, um, there is a particular kind of postgraduate teaching, which also invites collaboration, co-authored papers. And of course, these co-authored papers create uh, uh, a network that, that goes throughout time of circulation of economic ideas. And there is a particular interesting moment uh, of two young uh, economists, Paul Krugman and George Braga de Macedo, in 77, who write a paper in English for a recently founded economics journal about uh, the political economy of the Portuguese Revolution. Um, using neoclassical tools, um, macro, basic uh, open economy macroeconomics, and, um, and saying that we need, we need a model to assess the causal relationships. But Portuguese is a very shaking ground to build models because everything is changing. Uh, we need models, but the Portuguese economy is a very dangerous, they use the expression dangerous ground to build models upon because, because everything is, is changing in very complex ways. But these two, a North American and a Portuguese economist, this collaboration is instructive in itself of a new pattern that will emerge from the 70s onwards. That is a pattern of America in a certain sense here we can talk really about using the concept of Americanization <laughs> because we have the collaboration of a Portuguese economist and a North American economist, both, both educated uh, respectively uh, in MIT and Yale, uh, uh, doing a diagnosis of the Portuguese economy that went against the grain of, of what they consider to be the political economy of the revolution. So they do a diagnosis about the role of uh, uh, cost push uh, inflation through wage increases that created all sorts of, increased all sorts of disequilibriums. And I think it's important to, I mean, to, to understand through oral history, through interviews, how they came to be together in this particular moment in time and how this collaboration really shaped because ideas circulate and then they change, but also economists circulate and they change. I always say, Paul, if you read Paul Krugman in the New York Times or if you uh, see him in, as a public intellectual in the North American context, the Paul Krugman that comes to Portugal is a very different Paul Krugman in terms of his own diagnosis and policy prescription from the Paul. So not only ideas change, but economists seem to change. And then we can talk about inconsistency or perhaps no inconsistency, he's only, he's only uh, uh, analyzing a uh, an economy that is different, that is positioned in a very different context. So the way they also understand what they are doing in different contexts, mobile economists of an international reputation is really, is really important. But also issues of status, of course are important. To be able to publish uh, with future Nobel 
awarded economists or with, in, in the case of the 80s, with recently awarded Nobel Prize economists. It was very important in establishing a new status for, for, for economists. Having written papers with Tobin or with James Buchanan, for example, to give two examples of economists that did their, their PhDs in the 70s, uh, is very important for, their, for the af uh, affirmation of a, of a new kind of way of doing economics in a country that was catching up very quickly with the economic practices uh, of the center. So fast that, that we are talking about two different landscapes intellectually from the one that Carlos Bastien uh, described until the 50s. When we get, get to the 80s, we have a very different intellectual landscape. And we can only do that, know that, through comparison, <laughs> by, by uh, working uh, with the research that already is in place about, about the economic circulation of economic ideas. Of course, and this uh, appears, and this is my final remark, throughout different papers, we have to have a, um, 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 perhaps a more clear model of the relationship between what happens in the economy <laughs> and what happens in economics. And sometimes when in the history of economic ideas, we have implicit understandings about this relationship. Um, in several moments, in several presentations, this, these relationships were, were assumed somehow. There is a connection between some connection between what happens in the economy and what's happening in economics, which goes both ways, actually. Because Anna's paper and the Costa presentations gave us hints of these two-way connections. But for example, is there a, a question, a research question, is there a connection and what kind of connection is this between the opening up of the Portuguese economy from the 50s onwards, reluctant opening up of the Portuguese economy, but actually really opening up of the, and the opening up of economics to, to external influences. And how this played out in the 70s and 80s. For example, if you interview Braga de Macedo, the finance minister, the, the, the professor of economics at, at Nova, finance minister, and one of the most widely published economists in international uh, journals, you, you, you get a sense that we were, he says, we were doing open macroeconomics. We were the first doing open macroeconomics. I studied with Dornbusch. Uh, I, w I was taught by Cooper and Triffin. We were a very, the Portuguese economy was an open economy, as a description, but it is simultaneously engaged in prescription. Some of our opponents wanted to close again the Portuguese economy. And actually, we want through liberalization to ensure the continuous opening up of the Portuguese economy. So <laughs> this, this relationship of true openness is both, in a sense, descriptive. There are causal mechanisms operating. But it's also for, for this particular economist in this particular moment of time, the 70s and 80s, prescriptive. Not, uh, so open, the, ma the open macroeconomic model is not only a description of the interdependencies, but also it's simultaneously a prescription for financial liberalization, commercial opening up, and eventually, uh, that's how he describes in the interview, the creation of an external mechanism that is able to push the Portuguese economy in certain directions through the integration in, in, in the EMU, the Economic and Monetary Union. What the, in Ita Italy is described in many studies of the role of Italian economist, Le vinco, El Vincolo Sterno. Creating a, a Vincolo Sterno is also important for the self understanding of economists in the Italian context. There are several studies about this already being done. But also, I would argue, in the Portuguese uh, context of the 80s. And actually, if you see their economic circulation of these economists, they not, they not only circulate through academia, but in the 80s, the same economy through policy making circles. That is IMF, World Bank, OECD, um, and, and this is of course new in the Portuguese context, European Commission. 
the policy circles in the European Commission became also very important. And this interaction between academia and policy making circles, particularly in what is still in the 80s, a very small scale intellectual community, is very important. Because they are, of course, mobilized, uh, invited uh, to, to be policy advisors or even directly policy makers in, in finance ministers, in the European Commission, in IMF, et cetera, et cetera. So economic circulation is a very interesting and multidimensional process, and I think we also have to be attentive to that. Thanks. And thanks all for, for, for coming and for the conversation, and I think we can sp I can speak for the project. I don't know, Vitor, if, of course, you want to do final remarks, perhaps? Uh, I hope that we can continue this, this conversation, particularly as we have more empirical material on this. I think it will be the, 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 the next uh, seminar will be much more applied to this particular case study, and we hope that we have much more empirical material to discuss and to test our own theories about, about the connecting principles. That's one of the challenges that was brought up, and I think we have to, I mean, to answer to that challenge. Thanks.